Hello, this is JP Haas. I'm going to do the MSK MRI1 uh, reading pattern uh, protocols and reporting module. This is meant to be a high yield basic introduction to how to read MRI of the pelvis and hip in the bone room, so you don't have to be scared to open that study when you uh, rotate through bone. Um, so it'll primarily be emphasizing this uh, reading pattern checklist based approach that I like to do, and I'll be uh, supporting that with a normal or, or fairly normal. Um, image that's going to be scrollable throughout the uh, course of the uh, module and then at the end I'll have the uh, all the images together on one so if you're going through later you want to look at try to look at all the anatomy yourself you'll be able to to do that there's uh, so we're going to go over MRI pelvis hip protocols and uses uh, we have multiple variants of pelvis and hip or MRI protocols and I'll just try to go through that pretty quickly I don't want to overwhelm or get off topic too much but uh, j but but just to note that the pelvis pain and the hip arthrogram protocol are a couple of our most commonly Im used imaging exams to look for uh, the main anatomy and uh, we'll go through a, a non-contrast most of our the one the one exam that we're going to be scrolling through is going to be a, a non-contrast exam without a triticular contrast I will do a quick uh, little comment on reporting freehand versus template um, and we'll use our again our pattern based reading approach where we'll have a checklist and I think that's the best way to do these is just to look at everything in a very regimented order the same way every time so you're uh, comfortable looking through. There's a scrollable normalist study at the end that uh, we'll, um, we'll look at and uh, again once again you can use that on your own if you'd like. Okay here's one of our main uh, protocols. I like to call it the boomer pelvis just because it'd be the typical uh, exam you look in, a, in an older patient with pain um, to look for um, fractures or who knows what else but the main thing to uh, one of the main things to know about this this protocol is that it's predominantly a larger field of view study so you have these axial and coronal images with this large field of view so it's not going to be a study where you're really trying to beat your head beat your beat your uh, beat yourself up trying to find tiny labral tears or subtle cartilage abnormalities uh, we're looking for more big picture things and overall assessment of the arthritis looking for fractures, uh, things like that. The only smaller field of view exam uh, we get on this uh, study is a sagittal T1 through the area of the uh, side with symptoms. So um, that's the one of the common pelvis hip protocols you'll see uh, in the bone room. And then the hip arthrogram is different. Now you'll see here that a lot of these have that smaller field of view because we do want to look at the cartilage and the labrum and things like that. And um, and uh, you have a large field of view coronal stir just to kind of get a big picture look at things as well. Uh, one important sequence from the hip arthrogram that we'll get into more later is this axial oblique. And uh, the thing to know about that is it's taken through the plane of the femoral neck. So here's uh, the, the planning sequence for that. And if you just think about that as scrolling up and down through the, through the femoral neck, this is a very helpful sequence to look at cartilage and labrum. Uh, this is a, a, the, a, one of our other main workhorse protocols, and we do, uh, you know, it seems like we do hip arthrograms most days, probably not every day, but we do hip arthrograms most days in the bone. Uh, other bone protocols to know about pelvis hip, there's a bone for tumor protocol, uh, emphasizing fluid sensitive images and post contrast images to look for uh, tumor. Uh, we have a total hip arthroplasty protocol. We're going to be using metal artifact reduction sequences to look for uh, local tissue reactions such as osteolysis or pseudotumors around the prosthesis. That's a pretty uncommon study, but that's a, something we can do. Um, a hip for labral tear. So labral tear is you know, typically better seen with intraarticular contrast, but we do have a non-contrast protocol that does have those smaller field of view uh, exams. And you can use if you if you are protocoling, you can use age to kind of help you know decide what would be the best study. You know, I, I, if it says rule out labral tear, you'll obviously be uh, be uh, more likely probably to order this or to protocol this as a labral tear. But younger patients where they're looking for labral tears or cartilage problems, uh, we would be uh, more likely to use this labral tear protocol. We have a hip abductor protocol, so the hip abductors are gluteus medius and minimus, where that's the main area of um, of interest. We have a sacroiliac joint protocol where there are things looking for sacroiliitis especially. And then there's other ones that I don't even have on here, like sports hernia, proximal hamstrings, distal hamstrings, but be on the scope for just your basic reading pattern for hip pelvis MRI. So if you do want to look at those, you, you can look at those on the online under the MSK division uh, web, uh, website, and those, those are available there. Template reporting is a... Um, thing um, where the MSK staff predominantly uses freehand dictation, but this is an example of a template or a structured report that we uh, that, that can be found on the RAD report RSNA website, which I think is a pretty good one. It shows just just kind of bullet points, everything kind of, kind of we're looking at um, 
and uh, can be used. Uh, Dr. Peters does have a um, a, um, a template for several of the, of the joints uh, on his uh, templates on PowerScribe. So if you do want to see some dictation shells for basic MRI uh, reports for MSK, his uh, his would be a good place to start. Um, okay. There's no right way to lay out in packs the um, the uh, exam, but I would ex just suggest f figure out which way you like to look at it best and doing it the same every single time. So coronal uh, T1 and PD fat sat, and then axial T1 and PD fat sat, I do across the top and the bottom, and then on the top, somewhere on the right, I'll put the sagittal T1. And I always have everything triangulated up. I like to look at everything in multiple planes and kind of triangulate and look what everything looks like. Um, so that is my advice about how, how to look at the pelvis, especially the pelvis pain studies. Here's the reading pattern. So this is the this is a large, you know, just the whole thing. Uh, you know, the hip, the pelvis hip does not have as many structures as, as some of the other joints. So uh, this is not a, as long as a, as a reading pattern, but um, good to just still do it in order and have a uh, and have a uh, pattern. So the tendons I do first, and we have a posterior attachments at the ischial tuberosity, some lateral uh, gluteus medius minimus attachments at the greater trochanter. And then we have an anterior attachment, especially the iliopsoas tendon at the lesser trochanter. Those would, be, those would be the three ones I would emphasize trying to get down. And then we have a lot of other muscles uh, uh, that we can go over as well, just to kind of know the anatomy that tend to be uh, less uh, looked at uh, um, functionally on an everyday basis, tend to be, not, tend to be more, more normal. Um, we can look at the bones, looking for fractures, uh, marrow edema to clue us into some other pathology. Uh, assess for femoral acetabular impingement, pincer and cam type impingement. We'll both we'll talk about both of those. And then uh, you know you need those smaller field of view images to see this well, but the hip joint to look for the labrum, especially in the cartilage. Uh, assess for joint fluid, ligamentum teres of the hip between the femoral head and the acetabular notch. Sacroiliac joints look for sacroiliitis. Uh, think about the neurovascular structures. And one final look after you're done with all that. The rest of the stuff with the uterus, prostate, ovaries, anything else that you might find in the pelvis, lymphadenopathy, something like that. Now, what I'll do is when I go through all these images and we're scrolling, I'll just clip a little part of what we're looking at. So if you're ever curious what we're going for, you can just look at the bottom right of the screen and you should say, okay, yeah, we're looking at the uh, ischial tuberosity, semimembranosis insertion right now, and you'll see how that works. So I use a systematic approach, like I said, um, just decide what way you want to look at it and stick to that pattern. But broadly, my approach is from the outside in, starting with outside with those tendons. So we'll do each one of those sets, anterior, uh, anterior lateral, and posterior. And uh, then we'll uh, go to the hip joint and the bones, uh, cartilage labrum and the hip joint itself. And then we'll back back out a little bit and look at the sacroiliac joint sacrum, neurovascular structures, and pelvic contents. Okay, so starting with the tendons, there's three main groups we want to evaluate. And this is a pretty important point because we're looking at that this like every time on the pelvis and I would try to just get this down. So if you, if you follow, uh, look at those hamstrings at their ischial tuberosity, look at the hip abductors. So the hip abductors is a collective term for gluteus medius and minimus at the greater trochanter and, and look at the iliopsoas on the lesser trochanter and we'll go through all those pictures. Um, other muscular tendon structures can be evaluated on a separate run through the images as needed and a lot of these uh, can be uh, Remind, can remind us of those uh, femoral or those pediatric avulsion fractures attachment sites that you have to remember rectus femoris sartorius from the iliac spines tensor fascia lata has a specific uh, appearance we'll show you that and then uh, once you get down to the thigh uh, there's the adductor compartment which are uh, the adductor muscles and uh, the proximal vastus muscles is in the anterior compartment of the upper thigh Okay, so starting with our um, ischial tuberosity, we're gonna look at those uh, hamstrings, tendons first. And there's three you kinda gotta get down. So I just think about them as starting at laterally and going medially, and I have them highlighted over here. But if I look at the ischial tuberosity here and just start on the more lateral side of it, um, I just try to find the most lateral tendon and I can say, okay, that's gonna be my semimembranosis. And the other two form a conjoint tendon before they separate, but it goes semimembranosis, biceps femoris, semitendinosis with those second with those latter two um, starting as a conjoint tendon and then and then eventually branching off into their separate structures um, as you scroll down from this ischial tuberosity you're going to see a muscle flash first and when you see that muscle flash that's the semitendinosis so that's the, the semitendinosis tends to have that more muscular part show up first just to know how those are separating out 
And here's a coronal image showing how those are also seen. Um, again, I, I would just recommend using uh, the triangulation, but here's an example of that semimembranosus, which is a little more laterally. And then as you come one slice adjacent, you can see the biceps femur and semitendinosus also attaching as hamstrings insertions. So let's scroll on some images and look. Now this is a larger field of view of coronal. Um, I think this study actually cuts off a little bit at the hamstrings because they were more specifically interested in the cartilage labrum in this case, but the anatomy was good and um, the quality was good. So I still thought it was good to use as the case to show and tell. But as we're coming more posteriorly, we're gonna start to come into these hamstrings on the both sides of the uh, hip here. And you'll see how these attach. Now, this was the last slice. You're not quite getting through them all, but uh, this is the hamstrings insertions right there. You know, you could argue maybe that's a tiny bit of signal there that could be potentially a little bit of tendinosis at that right hamstring's origin. Okay, and then we'll follow it here on the right on uh, axial images. And as we come down from high to low, we're gonna start to look at our ischial tuberosity here. And this first one that we're looking for is that semimembranosus. And then somewhere over here is gonna be the biceps femoris and the semitendinosus. And you see how this, um, one starts to form a muscle first. Now we don't just see the muscle that well, just cause it's, um, this person is so muscular, there's kind of poor definition between the specific muscles, but this little muscle that's showing up first is the, is the semi-tendinosis, just, just. Okay, moving on to the lateral tendons. Uh, collectively, these are the hip abductors, uh, just reinforcing gluteus minimus and medius. So think of the gluteus minimus as the more anterior one, the gluteus medius is the more posterior one. And they have different facet attachments. So I just think about the facets as they attach to because I want to try to look at them all. Uh, the gluteus minimus has a more anterior facet attachment and the gluteus medius has a uh, both a lateral and a superior posterior facet attachment. Okay, and you can see here where we're uh, lining up. So this is kind of a mid portion of the hip. You're just seeing how these uh, gluteus uh, tendons are gonna come down and insert on their uh, greater trochanteric attachments. This is a pretty common area of abnormality for the hip MRI's uh, gluteus minimus, tendinosus, or partial tears. So this is definitely something we wanna be looking at. So let's follow those down on our, um, on our images here. Now, this is our glute max back here. We're not as concerned about that but just know that the gluteus minimus is this more uh, anterior muscle and the gluteus medius is this more posterior muscle. So as we follow these tendons down right here, we're gonna be looking at how those come down and insert. So this is that, this is that gluteus minimus right here. And this is gonna be those two areas, the lateral and the superior posterior facet of gluteus medius back here. And I kind of made a mess. So let's see if I can, maybe erase a little bit. Um, but uh, that's this is one look at uh, how these all kind of come down and attach at the greater trochanter, with this being a more normal look. And I can't go back and forth. I apologize to uh, scroll here, but um, this is a normal look for those uh, gluteus minimus medius attachments. And as we do the coronal, Uh, once again, we're showing these um, gluteus uh, tendons and muscles right here, coming down and insert on the uh, greater trochanter, which is a normal look. Okay, something else to keep in mind. So I've already shown you how those attach at these different facets, you know, anterior for the gluteus minimus, lateral and superior posterior for gluteus medius. There's also bursa. One bursa we often think about is there's, little, there's fluid superficial to those tendons in the greater trochanteric bursa. So that's just superficial. Um, but there's also subgluteus medius and subgluteus minimus bursa, which are deep to their respective tendon insertions. So if you see a tiny lo locule of fluid at the insertion of those tendons, uh, yeah, you can think about partial tear if you don't think it's completely disrupted, but it could also just be a little bit of bursitis. So uh, it's anatomy that I think you need to think about when you're doing these. Um, okay, I think that's all we need to say about that. Anterior tendon, so I'm just gonna, this main one here to emphasize is the iliopsoas tendon. You see we're uh, through the level of the lesser trochanter here, more or less. And we're just showing how this uh, iliopsoas attachment attaches nicely at the lesser trochanter as a normal finding. Possible path pathology we're looking for would be bursitis, tendinosis, partial tear, or strain. We'll show you some examples of that here in a second. 
and let's scroll through the anterior, look at the anterior tendons here to see how that comes down and attaches nicely and normally at the lesser trochanter, normal iliopsoas. Okay, here's some examples of abnormality um, of the iliopsoas. This is a pretty subtle finding, but here's some uh, increased signal in the um, iliopsoas showing some tendinosis without tear. Here's some bursitis that's typically located along the medial margin of the tendon uh, for some iliopsoas bursitis. And um, here is a myotendinous strain. So those myotendinous strains by definition should be kind of centered at the myotendinous junction. But here we have a lot of uh, edema, both intramuscular edema and then uh, myofascial edema about the iliopsoas muscle compatible with strain. Other tendons to think about, uh, like I said, would be sartorius, rectus femoris, tensor fascia lata. Tensor fascia lata has this typical appearance where there's stippled marbling of it. And that's the structure that uh, continues to form the iliotibial tract at the lateral uh, pelvis and hip. Um, the vastus muscles are show up first, uh, just posterior to those. So this is the vastus intermedius. This is the vastus lateralis. You can follow those down as you'd like. And then over here is going to be our adductor compartments, which is another uh, compartment that I'll look at on every case just to make sure it looks okay. And we'll show you what that looks like here in a second. Um, this is another cut. Again, we're kind of near the less, the greater trochanter here, but there's uh, muscles uh, uh, in the um, a little bit more superior superior than than that adductor compartment, but. Uh, the pectineus muscle is that most anterior muscle that you'll see coming, uh, starting. And then I just think of these obturator externus and internus muscles as kind of hugging the ischium. Uh, not, too, not, an, not a muscle that we typically see as abnormal, but uh, just to go over the anatomy. Uh, so, and then we go down further to look at the adductor muscles. And I do think that, that though that's a, a little bit more often abnormal uh, uh, compartment. So try to remember that anatomy and uh, the thing I just got in my head eventually was as it go from anterior to posterior it goes longus brevis magnus uh, so you have adductor longus here then adductor brevis and adductor magnus as you're coming down and like you see here on this inset here we're located a little more inferiorly in the uh, pelvis uh, in the upper thigh just showing this uh, adductor compartment so this will be those vastus muscles um, and this will be some of that sartorius rectus femoris over here So let's follow that down one time. And I think this is mostly just to show the um, adductor muscles. Now, once again, this is a very muscular person uh, and there's not a lot of definition of fat between the myofascial planes, but this is, uh, this is that adductor compartment that I was trying to tell you about. Then we'll back out and look at the bones a little bit. Uh, the bones, um, I think you should do a dedicated run to look at all the bones. Um, both the T1 and the fluid sensitive images. Um, the T1 can be helpful to look at marrow just to make sure there's a normal kind of red and yellow marrow pattern without a confluent marrow placement process that would uh, be low in T1 signal. And then I, I like to think of just looking at bright, look for bright spots. I'm just looking on those fluid sensitive images for bright things to, that's marrow edema that's gonna clue me into some other abnormality there and to, to, to tease that out further. Uh, so here on the, a couple examples on the left of Stress fractures, some of, some of the common, common findings we'd be looking for, especially with those uh, uh, pelvis, pelvis pain protocol MRIs. Stress fractures, linear, hypo-intense, abnormal, abnormal, abnormal signal. Other things we could look at would be like avascular necrosis, a pretty common abnormality in the femoral head. So we can look for avascular necrosis. Um, And I will show you our large field of view coronal images once again. And, and if I'm looking at this case for real, I'd be okay looking at the bones, just looking at the marrow. Is the marrow signal normal? Even in the lower lumbar spine, uh, looking for fracture or other abnormality. I like the summing diagram for FAI, which we're gonna talk about a little now. Uh, so there's two main types of femoroacetabular impingement. There's cam impingement and pincer impingement. Um, so think of cam as the uh, femoral head slash neck bump, anterior bump, osseous protuberance, and the pincer is acetabular anterior overcoverage. So um, you can have combined abnormality or one of each, but 
Uh, this slide emphasizes just how the chondrolabral junctions, the main area of injury in the cam, and the labrum itself is the area of injury typically in the pincer. Um, and if you have a combined, probably anything goes, but uh, just 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 a little diagram to show you how the how the hip flexes, adducts, and internally rotates to cause stress on those structures, uh, and what kind of happens. So this would be like uh, just an example of a uh, anterior labral tear, and then you can get contra crew what's called contra coup abnormalities in the posterior as well, um, especially with the pincer type. Okay, so a little bit more on femoral acetabular impingement. Um, X-rays are very helpful to look for cam and pincer because we have uh, nice findings that we can look at the body anatomy for, especially acetabular crossover sign, looking for the acetabular retroversion. Um, now, on MRI, we get those axial oblique images that I was talking about that go through the axis of the femoral neck, and you can you can use those images to get an alpha angle. An alpha angle is an assessment for CAM. A normal alpha angle is less than 55 degrees, uh, and you get the alpha angle by drawing a best fit uh, circle at the femoral neck on the axial oblique images through the mid portion of the femoral neck, and then you just draw a bisect the femoral neck, and then you make your other line is uh, just the, the line where the femoral neck starts to offset or come off uh, the femoral head. So where you get that loss of femoral head neck, neck offset. And if the bump is too much, it'll, it'll, make this, um, it'll make this angle too wide. So this does not visually look like a big cam, but you know measured greater than 55 degrees. So it was technically compatible with cam. And it's just an example, I think, from rad source. Um, oftentimes on these axial oblique images, you'll see the uh, bump better. Um, so if you just see a gross osseous protuberance here, uh, you'll be more convinced. Now, we do not typically report on these alpha angle measurements on our MRIs, just because I think there's a lot of inter-observer variability depending on who's measuring it and exactly where that, where that bump is. So we are, we are very descriptive about, about uh, if we see a cam deformity without specifically measured, measuring the alpha angle typically when we look at these studies. Uh, here's other things that we can look at for uh, the pincer. Uh, increased lateral subtural edge angle, something we look at on x-ray sometimes, but you can you know, do it on MRI, I suppose, if you wanted. Uh, so if you draw a, a true vertical, a, a, again, a best fit circle at the mid uh, femoral head, and then make a line to the lateral acetabular rim, the normal for that would be 25 to 39 degrees. So if that's too much, that's uh, acetabular overcoverage and could be a setup for pincer. And then acetabular version. Now we have a protocol on CT where we do acetabular version for Dr. Freeman, especially uh, who does a lot of the uh, FAI cases. But uh, the normal version, the normal uh, acetabular uh, morphology is antiverted. So antiverted means that you would have uh, kind of a more anterior um, inclination of the of the acetabulum. So this is an example of retroversion, where relative to the vertical, the anterior acetabulum is uh, more overcovered than the posterior acetabulum. Here's the um, here's a couple examples of um, CAM FAI with labral tear, and like I said before, so this is a more visual, I think, satisfying than that other case where they were measuring the alpha angle. You can just see how that is too uh, too, too protuberant. That's a that's a clear CAM morphology of the anterior femoral head neck junction. Uh, a common place for tears of the um, labrum, if you have a CAM uh, FAI, would be the anterior superior labrum. And this is a nice example of an anterior superior labral tear seen on a sagittal image. The hip joint has capsular ligaments. Uh, and just two that you could throw into your memory would be the iliofemoral ligament anteriorly and the ischiofemoral ligament posteriorly. Not typically abnormal, but uh, that is the uh, anatomic names for the capsular ligaments of the hip. Uh, and then a little bit of discussion on the labrum. So the labrum is difficult. Uh, labrum is difficult both in the shoulder and the hip, but there's good things to kind of break it down to help. So um, one of the most important things is that there's no inferior labrum of the hip. So don't, don't try to just remember that you don't come in and say, oh, yeah, I think there's an inferior labral tip here. I, uh, that's that's a trap. There's no inferior labrum of the hip. There's an inferior transverse lig uh, ligament of the hip, but that is not the labrum. So this is this is how the hip is configured um, with clock face morphology. Now I think clock face is good by convention. The anterior labrum is always uh, anterior superior labrum is always 12 to 3 o'clock. Uh, but um, 
that this is something that can be used just to show how where exactly on that clock face your labral tears are. And then this was a nice AJR schematic just showing uh, the configuration of labrum cartilage and bone. So stone cold normal here on top. Now on the bottom left here, we have what would be more likely to be a sulcus. So you have a smooth recess at the contralabral junction, which doesn't is not completely separated and has a smooth appearance. Um, and I'll sh we'll, we'll talk, the one place where you often have this that you shouldn't call a tear is the posterior inferior labrum back here. And I'll show you an example of that. Uh, so this is this would be like a recess or a sulcus where these last two are tears. So in the in the middle picture here, you have the labrum completely separated, which could should not happen in with a with a recess. So that's a contralabral separation, which is a variant of tear. And then here on the right, you're just showing how there's a labral substance abnormality, and um, there's um, contralabral separation and then abnormal uh, morphology and signal in the labrum itself. And then this is trying to show a paralabral cyst. So these are the labral tear findings. Um, this is another uh, way you can describe the labrum, which I think is completely appropriate uh, as anterior, anterior, superior, posterior, superior, and posterior, which I thought made a lot of sense. And then you have that inferior transverse ligament of the hip down here. Uh, here's a nice example of that normal variant posterior inferior sulcus. So if you're scrolling on your images and you see that nice fluid recess, it's kind of a prominent one at that posterior inferior uh, hip, but that's a that's a common location of that normal variant. So don't call that a tear. Um, and my last advice with this, just be descriptive. You know, sometimes it's hard to really tell if these are tears or not, but you just kind of have to say what you see. And know that most labral tears are anterior and anterior superior, especially in the setting of FAI. All right, so these are kind of smaller images just because I put up so many, but uh, just to give you one look at the labrum here. So we're kind of, we're going high to low here. So we're gonna start to come down in the labrum and think these are the true axials. I'm not totally sure, but we can just see our triangles here. Now, actually, I think what was called here is a subtle anterior labral tear. And I don't think it's showing super well here just because it's a little bit of a smaller image. But if you look right there, there's a little bit of intrasubstance linear signal in that anterior labrum which I think was suspicious for tear. And you can look at that later. And maybe this actually does also have, we're already a little bit throughout that sulcus in the posterior inferior. But this is one look at the labrum on axial and coronal, especially looking at this superior labrum, black triangle without discrete convincing tear. And then finally, the sagittal. The sagittal is especially helpful for the anterior superior labrum. And you kind of have to be careful and just, you only know, usually get it on a couple, two, three images. Just looking really carefully at this anterior superior labrum for tear. Um, so in this case, it looks like maybe there was some anterior labral tear of subtle. Ligamentum teres is the ligament between the femoral head and the uh, acetabular fossa. It can be torn or degenerated, a uh, pretty uncommon finding, but there, that is a, uh, an abnormality that can be symptomatic. So do look at the ligament of teres of the hip to, to see, make sure it's um, normal. Typically, it would just be a dark black <coughs> structure. Uh, then we go to the sacroiliac joints. So the sacroiliac joints uh, can have uh, things like insufficiency fracture or sacroiliitis. Uh, on the top left here, we have an example of that where you have an abnormal edema and enhancement about the sacroiliac joints, uh, which is compatible with sacroiliitis, which you'll see especially on those pelvis pain protocols. And things like insufficiency fractures. So once again, when you're looking at your bones, you're looking for edema. Oh, look, we see edema in the sacrum and we kind of characterize that out further. So we should with these linear low uh, signal abnormalities consistent with insufficiency fractures in the sacrum. Another thing that I think was worth uh, remembering or reviewing here is the SI joint has variant anatomy where there's an inferior synovial part and a superior ligamentous part. So this is, these A and Bs are up higher. So this is um, that more broad li uh, ligamentous part of the joint, which is uh, not synovial. Okay, so then uh, neurovascular structures, getting towards the end here, uh, just review those. Uh, so out front, we have the femoral nerve, uh, and we can follow it sort of back towards the area of the lumbosacral plexus, though on our images, musculoskeletal bone protocol images, we're not really looking too much at the lumbosacral plexus. 
uh, but we, it goes uh, nerve, artery, vein, going from lateral to medial. And then I like to follow this sciatic nerve out across the sciatic notch, which is kind of along the posterior margin of the acetabulum. You can always, all, most often find this stippled fascicular structure is the sciatic nerve as it comes out, comes down and starts to course towards the posterior thigh. So we can look at that anatomy a little bit where we're looking at the sciatic nerve back here and the femoral nerve out here. Not super well seen on our case, but that's the best we can get right now. Okay, then one last look for other things. So that would be my recommendation for all these studies is once you're done with all your bones, muscles, ligaments, cartilage, all that kind of stuff, take a step back and look for other abnormalities. So uh, things like diverticulosis, inguinal lymphadenopathy, a mass that you weren't expecting either in the subcutaneous tissues or the pelvis. Look at the sex organs like the prostate, uterus, ovary. Uh, sometimes you'll make a, 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 another finding that will be helpful or important. And that's actually it. So uh, that's a quick one through of how to look at pelvis uh, hip MRIs. Um, once again, here at the end, you can on your own scroll through this and try to sort out the anatomy and get used to how it looks. Um, e anatomy is also a very good resource to uh, look at this too. They have very good uh, high quality studies on there that you can label the anatomy with. Um, and I would recommend doing that as well. Um, I hope this is helpful to uh, get started with reading hip MRI in the bone room. Um, the hip, I think, was a little bit intimidating just because maybe we don't, I don't know. I, we image it fairly frequently, but it just seems to be anatomy that, uh, I don't know, it, seemed, it was uh, one of the last ones for me to be most comfortable with, but it's really not too scary because, like I said, there's not, um, not, too, too, not too, too much to look at as far as the number of structures. And here's finally our axial oblique. So this is a real nice, real nice study to look at the labrum and uh, showing what I think is probably a little anterior labral tear. Thanks for listening and I hope this was helpful. We'll see you in the bone room.